is. I'm here. I was trying to do it on my iPad and be really super cool, but it doesn't work so well on my iPad. So you've got me on my iPhone. So you've got a real close-up of me. I apologize oh, for that. Look at yours. No, definitely not. <laughs> Can I do it that way? That's a less close-up. <laughs> close-up is fine. Okay, cool. We'll do it that Your way. hair's looking good, by the way. Well, you know, you get like, uh, if somebody had said to me when I, you know, if I'd had the choice when I was born and they said you can have a, a metabolism like a racehorse or good hair, good skin and good teeth, I'd have picked the latter, but sometimes I regret not. I'd really wish I had a, a metabolism like a racehorse, but yeah, um, I'm lucky. I'm very, very lucky. And um, I guess having kind of long, slightly crazy hair, anyway has been a real blessing in the time of a quarantine when I can't go near a hairdresser because it's just continued to be crazy and long so yeah I'd love a bit of I'd love a bit of TLC but yeah yeah I'm the same like I'm like I'll, I'll just keep going with it because it's kind of mine's dark naturally but yeah. I'm like I'm just gonna roll with it it's fine yeah yeah I think um I think Balayage is like one of the greatest invention, uh, greatest inventions ever because it's that kind of like like that grown out roots look. Somehow it's now really cool and trendy. So, so yeah, you know exactly. We'll just roll with it. I'm, I'm really on board with the whole balayage thing or ombre or whatever it calls. But yeah, yeah, it's I, like I, the lockdown look, darling. <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, the lockdown Pioneer look. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Let me turn you up. Hang on. There we go. Okay. So, so we've kind of covered off I, lockdown life already a little bit. So how, how have you been coping other than hair issues? Have you been okay? Um, so, well, this is weird because like, I know you and we're friends. So this like, I, I might just, you need to kind of rein me in if I start talking about crazy <laughs> stuff because I just feel like we're having a chat. I'm so glad. That I know, I'm saying it's like, no one's watching. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm so glad that we're do I'm doing it with you and, and not somebody I don't know because I'd be a bit more nervous. But yeah, so, well, you know I had COVID and that wasn't great. Um, and I'm the first to hold my hand up and say that I probably over underestimated it. You know, I bought into all the world, you know, it's only really bad if you're over a certain age, but it absolutely floored me. And um, so for the kind of the first few weeks of lockdown, I was so poorly anyway, I couldn't have gone out. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just, it was, it was pretty brutal and obviously, you know, uh, it's been, it's been a really hard time for everybody. I'm very, very grateful that I was just a mild case and enormously kind of upset about all the people who've lost people. It just seems like 2020 has been such a, a, a big traumatic year. Um, but I, um, I struggled. I really struggled at the initial stage of of lockdown, just being ill and also being, which probably didn't help, being really concerned about what this meant for me in the future. I think as kind of humans, we're creatures of habit. We love structure, we love boundaries. Even those of us who crave kind of adventure, we need structure and boundaries. It makes us feel safe. So when you live in this very uncertain, very, you know, flexible, I guess, um, world, not knowing you know, work's being cancelled, work's being shelved, work's being moved, you know, months forward. And you're thinking, how's my life going to look in six months? Um, I think that added to the whole kind of sense of nervousness, anxiety. And I'm, I'm not sure that really helped with my recovery. But I feel like, and, and you'll get this, I feel like as a freelancer and as a creative, I feel like we're good at being adaptable. That's one of our strengths, you know. Nobody digs deeper than freelancers, you know, because we, we don't have that regular pay. We need to be thinking about ways in, in how to, to make money. But um, for me, I, um, I felt like I was excavating myself at one point. That's how deep I was digging. You know, I was just like, I've got no oasis to pull here. I'm, I'm ill, I'm unwell, I'm homeschooling, I'm cooking, I'm cleaning. And Claire, I ain't cut out that shit. I, I am not some little earth mother. I love my children. They mean the world to me. I love being a mum, but my job is, is, who, is also what defines me, you know? So I felt like I'd kind of, I'd lost a lot of me and my identity. I felt like I'd gone back about 50 years. Like I was some kind of 1950s housewife, cooking, cleaning, <laughs> homeschooling, you know? And I was like, I, I, I want to do fun games. I want my life back, you know? So, but it's, yeah. So that's a very long way of saying it's been challenged. Mm. But there, like with everything, I, I, I'm, I'm a glass half full person. And I feel like maybe 2020 is the storm to clear our path. You know, there's been lots of stuff that's happened that's been bad, but maybe it's Big a reset. Stuff. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. huge stuff. I mean, you know. Life-changing. Uh, life-changing stuff, you know, everything. It just feels like everything's being kind of shifted and, and we're all looking to kind of really like look within and, and re-examine our priorities, I guess. So, And it has forced, it has forced me to be much more to diversify in terms of my business. So I've, I've been offering lots more of my services online and doing a lot of one-to-one. And I was really worried that I wouldn't get that connection because styling is so, it's, it's really intimate. You know, you, you kind of form, it's like therapy, you form a real relationship and a bond with your clients, even brands, you know, they have to, people buy you in relationships, not, not, not products necessarily. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I mean, not I the clothes, like, it's more like, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah but how you feel you know, with it all up. Uh huh. Exactly, and it's all about your energy. And I was like, "How's that going to translate over a screen?" I'm not sure that it can, but it's actually worked out really well. And then I held a kind of um, a, a styling workshop the other day, and then um, it was my my, my it, I, it was a really kind of diverse bunch of people, but also it was people from like 300 miles away. And I came off it going, "I wouldn't have got that before." People aren't going to schlep to London or where I live in Hampshire. Yeah half day workshop from Liverpool but they're going to do it when they can just pop onto Zoom so it's been it the whole world doesn't it just like that exactly exactly and I mean that's I guess that's the power of of social media and, and the digital world we live in I find technology is not my strength I'm a creative you know but I I've really had to adapt to that and, and I feel like as I said as freelancers we're good at adapting we are, we are hustlers aren't we like I think I've found that like We've got a different level you can go to like a different gear and it you like you go like okay adversity i know this i can like yeah I can get through it so you kind of do feel yourself kicking up into that next thing but i'd like to ask you as well because there must be lots of people who are really interested in how you got to where you are so i know you like you're from the north as well aren't you like i'm a northerner as well yeah. but you went down to london for a start to do styling didn't you to do uh, was it a college yeah yeah so like my um my accents kind of disappeared unless i'm it depends on how drunk tied emotional i am and how many <laughs> I'm, I'm surrounded by but it, it does come out um i mean if you spoke to my mum and dad you'd know that i was i was a northerner Comes but, out. <laughs> um, I, I, I really identify as a northerner actually i think um like i live down here and i've probably spent more of my life down here and this is where my kids are but when my kids talk i'm like how did i get these posh children you know they're like where, <laughs> where are these people <laughs> Yeah, they're so posh. Um, but no, so I, I kind of, my dad was in the military, so we moved around and I left, I, I lived in various places across the north, but we, we, we moved all over the place. And um, I remember as a child, it was my kind of dream. Do you remember on perfume bottles when we were literally, you say London, Paris, New York, or like yes. any kind of brand always said London. And I was like, I'm going to live in London, Paris, New York in my life. And it took me till I was like 27, but I lived in London, Paris, New York. And I, that, was, that was my goal. But I've always felt like, and this is the hill I will die on, London is the fashion capital of the world. I don't care what anybody says, it is. You know, there are lots of cool cities in the world. And I know that kind of the Scandinavians are are building a good case for being very kind of hip and cool and up and coming. But London remains, for me, the fashion capital. You can wear whatever you like in London and people won't bat an eyelid. I love that by London. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's always been like that, you know, and lots and lots of big movements started in London. And we could get into a whole discussion about that because it's quite a diverse city and welcomes lots of different, you know, races, colours and creeds. And I think that's that's why. But ultimately, I, I felt like if I was going to study fashion, it had to be in London. And that's no disrespect to anybody who didn't, but I just felt like I had to be there. So, yeah. I, uh, I trained in London at the London School of Styling and I did the London School of Styling because it offered me an opportunity to do it, to be able to work. I, you know, I'm not a vanity project. I had to work and, mm. and do it at the same time. I couldn't just take six months out of my life and do it and with no money. So it was a really kind of flexible, flexible option. And I did it, um, I did it with them and, and they were able to offer weekends and evenings and days and and it was also affordable. Um, and so I'm, I'm enormously grateful to them because they, they gave me my grounding. And I guess I feel like I'm, this is poss- possibly a Northern thing, but it was, it was definitely something that, you know, I, I always, I think women, we suffer from that imposter syndrome. Lots of people set themselves up as stylists and refer to themselves as stylists. But I felt, because there's, there's no kind of official, official kind of like, not like, it's not like a protected name. Like literally anybody can call themselves a stylist. But mm. I felt like I couldn't unless I got the grounding, unless I got the background, you know, I felt like it would be inauthentic to not 
to not have a background in it and just kind of go in it. Obviously I was interested in it, it was what I wanted to do. Um, but I felt like in order to be taken seriously and to be credible, I had to have that grounding. I had to have that certificate that said, yes, she did it. And also it's, it was re really useful to, great for networking. I met loads of other stylists. I'm still in touch with my tutors, you know, and, and lots of the girls that I qualified with. And, and they've kind of been really big cheerleaders of mine. So I would, I would recommend if anybody was going to go into it that you definitely get your kind of training. Okay. And mm. wherever you get it from is what works for you. But I did it on my terms. I did it at a flexible, affordable place that offered me a kind of a, a, a really good foundation. Am I talking too much, Claire? Sorry. No, no. I think it's really interesting because I'm always really... Because you basically see these people successful and you're like, oh God, like what, you know, what did they do to get successful? It's like, there's all this other stuff you did for years and years and years, but we never really talk about that bit. Like, yeah, sure. I got a degree in like, you know, 2000 or whatever, but you don't go on about that, do you? So it's like, it's nice to, especially to show people where you came from and how much hard work it takes so that they know if they want to go into that, they're not just going to be styling celebrities tomorrow. It like, will take time. No. So I really love that. No. And you, like, yeah. I know you started off doing lots of, like, bits for free and stuff. Like, so how did that, sort of, when you'd done your training, you then went into getting started, didn't you, a little bit? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I reach, I mean, I'm, I'm 45 now, so I'm well old. But um, <laughs> I'm sometimes I can't believe it myself. I'm like, how did I get that age? Like, who? <laughs> um, I retrained in my 30s, and I've always been really honest about that. And I, I believe um, that timing is everything. I mean, if, if ever there were a phrase to kind of encapsulate my life, it's timing is everything. Because I feel there's a right time to do everything. And um, for me, it meant that what I brought to the course and brought to my training was a certain level of life experience, mm. which are transferable skills. You, you know, I turned up on time to my course. I was never hung over. I was like Hermione Granger. I was the most enthusiastic person on that course because my hunger for it was so much. I wanted it. I'd mm. fought for it. I was working as well alongside it. So I had to like really devote all my time for it to it. But um, I felt like in some ways my age, I thought my age was going to go against me, but it didn't because when mm. I qualified, obviously I wasn't like 20 something. I was 30 something and people assumed because of what I brought to the plate, that I was more experienced than I was. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I just didn't disabuse them of that. I wasn't like, oh no, I only qualified a year ago. I was just, I, I was just, they were just like, oh, you're, you know, you seem to know what you're doing. And I was like, yeah, great, thanks. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It's like what but they I, say, isn't I, it, about always saying yes to everything and then working out how to do it afterwards. <laughs> that's a great segue, Claire. So basically when you talked about doing stuff for free, I had a year where I said yes to everything. Like I literally, my comfort zone was so far off the horizon, you couldn't even see it. So like music, <laughs> Videos, everything I was like you know and, and, and music videos with really young like cool people I was like I'm just not worthy you know and, and I genuinely feel like it, it's a it's definitely a female thing and um, we have this kind of imposter syndrome where we think we can't do it and like all you need 20 seconds of insane courage and you can do anything like if you say yes to something as long as your gut isn't going this is this is a really bad thing like you know if, as long as everything all the kind of signals you're getting this, this you're going to get absolutely screwed here go for it but even if you do get screwed that's a lesson in itself you know so I it's not like I haven't been thrown under a bus or people have absolutely you know taken advantage I 100,000% have but that kind of year of saying yes is what stood me in good stead so mm. i did some free stuff i did some stuff for nothing um and i was still working very very part-time so that because you know i've got to put fish fingers on the table um but i was i was doing it, it was it was that was my grounding and i you know and then and then those people that i the good people come back right so the people i worked with in the early days and i kind of set up look i'll do this for you for this they came back and they mm. were like we know your worth we, we're gonna we're going to pay you this much this time. How does that feel? And you just gradually, gradually, it's networking. And you also wheedle out the good and the bad mm. or, the, or the less desirable, you know? I do believe that. I do believe that you have to, you, you know, the most grounded, the most interesting people are not the people who've had, you know, like a really easy time of it. The mm. most interesting people are the people who've worked really hard and who've had a few knocks and who, you know, and, and who know who the right people are and, and, and then you end up gravitating towards those and they end up gravitating towards you. Mm. 
And did that you, um, so your brand name, obviously, Sulky Doll, did you have that from the beginning or did that kind of come in a bit late when you were like, oh God, I need a name or I need like an identity? So um, that's a really good question. So basically, Sulky Doll was my nickname as a teenager, uh, I'm not, uh, Anna, Anna is kind of an, an adolescent, should I say. So because I was very sulky um, uh, <laughs> if I was cross and upset, but um, I was, I was they, I, at the time, it's hard to, I, they thought I looked like a doll. So I was referred to as Sulky Doll, so it's my nickname. So when I was thinking about a brand name, um, what I need, I was still working in another field at the time. So I needed to almost have this alter ego. So Sulky Doll was my alter ego. And also I kind of did a poll and I said to people, what do you think about this name? And some people were like, mm, it sounds a bit porno to me. It sounds a bit kind of like sex doll. And then oh other God, people I never thought like, <laughs> No, I know I get, you know, I get some very, very interesting DMs. People sliding into Bet my Instagram very interesting <laughs> types. Hey, what um, do you think about me? Mine's naked VR girl. Do you mind? Yeah, 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 well, you know, you are my people, Claire. You know, you're not afraid. <laughs> Let's pick a really random name and like roll with it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's but the the important thing is is that it doesn't matter if it's a marmite name. What matters is it's memorable because no disrespect to other stylists who go just by their name, and most of my stylist friends do. And you know, my name's out there in the public domain. My actual name. But I felt like it was memorable. Sometimes you're thinking about a stylist, unless it's really well known, like, oh, what's their name? What's their name? Where a sulky doll is like, it's there. Mm -hmm. So it became, and, and she did become my alter ego. So even now on shoots and on sets, I get referred to as sulky. Mm -hmm. People message me sometimes and go, hey, sulky. <laughs> and uh, I like that. It's like so, Beyonce and her stage name, isn't it? It's like, you know, yeah, that's, let's be Sasha Fierce today. Let's get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. So she, she's basically my alter ego. Yeah. 100%. I love that. And, um, and so you have ended up on this amazing roller coaster. And I think probably the, one of the biggest things that you've done is probably the Oscars, I think, that I assume from this point of view anyway, how, was, how did that come about? And because you actually ended up going to LA and everything, didn't you? It was all very exciting. Yeah, yeah, no, it was. And I, you know, um, it was, and I, I can, I mean, it's like, it's two and a half years ago now, but yeah, I, I it, and it's a weird one, isn't it? Because like, obviously I was really excited about it, but um, really excited. And I'll talk about how I got there. But I feel like when you think about how you're going to be in a situation, if somebody had said to me, oh my God, this time next year you're going to be in LA, I'd be like, woo! But then when you get there and you're working, and you just, you're just yeah. kind of in the moment. And it mm. wasn't really until I was in the taxi going back to the airport to come back home. I just like sobbed. Mm. I sobbed because I was so overwhelmed. I was like, this has been the most amazing experience and I've lived it and nobody can ever take it away from me. And now it's kind of over. But, you know, I, 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 you know, I think the, the taxi driver thought I was absolutely insane. But um, how I got that, and this is what I mean about timing. So my background, as you know, is therapy. So I mean, I still am. I'm a qualified speech and language therapist. And I worked with children with special needs. And a bit like it goes back to my northern roots. My my mum is a scouser. And I wanted to be a makeup artist. But when you're from quite a working class background, and your parents are, you know, quite, you know, strict, there was no way my mum was going to allow me to be a creative, you know, this was this was like 30 years ago. She was like, no, no, you need a profession. You need this. You, you're a smart girl. You need to have some solid kind of stuff. So I, I ended up going to university, qualifying in a profession, doing speech, speech and language therapy, becoming um, successful in that career, really enjoying it, but always, always being um, very into fashion and clothes. So like I used to rock up at staff meetings and people were like, who is that girl? You know, who is that girl in the jumpsuit? You know, like, that's not what we wear. So it was, it was, no, it was no surprise to my colleagues when I said, you know, what, I want to do this. But it was a real kind of head when I was doing both jobs at one time. Because I remember, like, one day I'd be working with a child with autism on the floor, getting really kind of, you know, doing groups, getting really messy. And then the next day I'd be on a shoot and there'd be, like, these people, like, losing their, can I swear? Mm -hmm. losing their shit you know about there not being like some kind of you know accessory and I'd be like man you need a real sense of perspective here and I think it kind of grounded me I mean now I am that person on shoots losing my shit about there not being an accessory but at the time I had that real kind of 
I was able to see, to, to have that grounding and that perspective. And it, it kind of made me quite humble and, and grateful mm. for what I had. But this is a long way around of saying, having that speech and language therapy background meant that I obviously have lots and lots of friends who are speech and language therapists. And The Silent Child was obviously, which was the film that won the Oscar, was about a little girl who was deaf. And one of my uh, best friends actually um, knew Maisie, Maisie Sly's interpreter. And they would, they'd been kind of, kind of um, the BAFTAs had basically ignored them, but the Oscars had really taken them to, to, their, to their heart, you know? And, and so they, when they got nominated, they were like, oh my God. So um, Kate uh, Katz, her, the interpreter, was given my number by my friend. And she went, hi, I've been given your number. Apparently you're a stylist. We're going to the Oscars. Um, do we go to Zara? And I was like, not on my watch, you don't, okay? <laughs> Leave it with me. So that, that was how it was born. And I literally got that, like, in, um, in uh, as soon as they got the kind of nomination, which I think was kind of December, I'm trying to, but it, I didn't have a big run in time. And I remember kind of um, ringing PRs and saying, I'm pulling stuff in and people wouldn't take me seriously. They were like, yeah, right, you're going to the Oscars, yeah. I was like, no, no, really I am. I'm going to the Oscars, can we pull some stuff in? I really need to get, you know, do you want yourself on the biggest platform in the world, the biggest red carpet in the world? And so I had a lot of brands not take me seriously, um, but the good ones did. And, you know, you always remember that loyalty. So interesting, isn't it? It's such a, like, yeah, one thing that leads to another, doesn't it? So it's like, yeah, you never kind of, you just don't know where things are going to lead to, do you? So it's a good lesson in, in taking opportunities when you can. I think so. And I think I'm a really good, um, like, poster girl for you're never too old. You know, I was 43. 42, 43 when I went to the Oscars. And um, yeah, and I, that, that, was, that was a big deal. And also I felt like, I mean, I'm a, you know this, I'm quite spiritual, I believe in the universe. And I felt like that was the universe telling me that timing was everything, that like I needed that, Os to, in order to get that Oscar gig, I had to have done speech therapy to have those connections, but I had to have done my fashion training as well. And it was like, it was like a beautiful coming together of my two professions and saying, there you go. Here's what happens when you follow your dream, but you also, you put the groundwork in at the start, you know? So, so yeah, it was, I mean, it was amazing. And I'm still in touch with lots of the people from that film. And there's some stuff coming up that I'll be able to talk about later. But of course, with what's happened this year, things are all a bit on hold, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it was an amazing project to be part of. It had a lot of heart, a lot of good people working on it. And I'm really, I'm, I'm enormously proud of it. Really am. So exciting. And then I suppose on from that, I've seen you working more and more with celebrities. Um, I know you've got Gemma Atkinson and Dr. Yeah. Rand, but in particular. So how did they come about? And has that kind of, I don't know, given you a, a sort of slightly new direction? Or were you kind of doing things like that before? Or So I had a couple. Um, I probably had like three or four before I went to the Oscars anyway. So and I think and they tended to be um, so I had a couple of authors and I, I've always had Juliet, Juliet Sear, the baker on this morning. In fact, I think she's on now. So I always have you and I had a few comedians, um, but they were, I guess they were less well known and they were, they were the, 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 the people I've got now. But yeah, the, so Gemma, um, Gemma I met was, was recommended. I was recommended to Gemma by somebody and then I was put in touch with Gemma and, um, and then yeah, that that really took off. And of course, at the time, then I was then I was working with Gorka, and then and then it's all word of mouth, you know this. So then then Gorka recommended me to Range because they were all on Strictly, and and then I've got and now I've got Range. Um, but I I I'm so grateful for the people that I work with because they're such lovely, lovely people, you know, mm. and not good vibes. Not all, yeah, not all celebrities are, you know, and you know that and I know that. And, and it's, but it's really lovely to work with genuinely lovely down to earth people. And what's really nice for me is that when I meet other creative, other makeup artists, other, you know, photographers, um, uh, they'll always say to me, oh my God, I love Rand or I love Gemma. They're so lovely. And it's like, that's a validation. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, yeah. That's why I work with them because you know, that there are, there are people in the industry who, who aren't that nice to creatives and it's a small industry and it, word gets round. So it's, it's really lovely. And I'm very, very privileged to work with the ones that I work with because they're just, they're just really good people. 
But I, oh. I kind of believe that your vibe attracts your tribe. If you're a good person, you put enough good at gather out there, event good, it eventually comes back to you. Back, yeah. I think. And it's interesting you say that about um, difficult things because I think your job as a stylist and my job as a PR, sometimes you do end up on the world's most intense shoots and what could, like you just don't know how they're gonna go. Sometimes yeah. it's like the birds are singing, everything goes perfectly. Yeah. You know, it's all really amazing and everyone comes away being like, oh my God, it's brilliant. And other times it's like, everything just goes wrong, doesn't it? And it's like, you know, it like so many things can go wrong. It's not even possible to actually prepare <laughs> because like no. the reason why you have your whole tool belt thing going on, isn't it? Because you have to be, you know, every button that comes off or zip that goes like, you know, you have to be really ready. And have you got any experiences that you've found challenging that you've come through on that sense? Like any tips for would-be stylists coming up through the ranks, what they can do? I think that, I think that's a really good point. And I feel like shoots in particular, you like, you know, I mean, prep, prep like your life depends on it, but know that on, on the day, it's an organic process. And there's just too many variables. It's very different when you're styling somebody because it's all on you. I love shoots absolutely love shoots but I'm just one part of the machine you know mm. as long as I've done my prep and I've rocked up and I'm doing my bit then then you can feel like you have done your bit but yeah it, it's very organic and I think it's all part of being a creative you know you just mm. you just have to expect sometimes the unexpected you know people can be late you know things can tell you know if it's an outdoor shoot you can have crap weather all there are just so many variables and I think you have to kind of relinquish a bit of control you have to not be control free acknowledge that you can only do what you can do make sure you've prepped make sure you turn up on time make sure you're not being a you know a diva or if you're, if you're being demanding make sure you're being respectful and humble to every single person on the shoot um and that's that's the most important thing that you can do um and don't like i still um, this sounds like I'm being really devressed. I don't mean it to, but I still assist on shoots. If I really want to be a part of a shoot, I will yes. go to the stylist and I will say, can I assist? Please, please, please. Can I be a part of this? Because it's just, it's just I know it's going to be a, a really beautiful process. And also it'd be nice to have those images as well. But yes. I think don't be, be humble, uh, but be prepared and, and know that it's not all on you. Don't feel like, even for you, even if you're creatively directing it, still know that it's 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 not just on you it's on every single person in that room and it's the energy that's why people end up working with the same people yes, it's not kind of it's not, nepotism. Yeah. it's not nepotism at all it's just their known quantities you know so people often say to me i get loads of dms saying could, could i come on a shoot with you and i really i feel like when you're at a certain level it's your responsibility to send the elevator down to kind of spread that that good that good fortune you know because i'm enormously grateful for where i am I've i love that phrase off. send the elevator down i love but, that but you have to right you have to because otherwise what's the point like you can't just it's a you know that kind of phrase that you know if if you've got enough don't kind of build a wall build a bigger table that's that's yeah. I, I feel like you, you do get out what you put what you put in and so I really really try and I would like to think that my like fellow creators would say the same that I really try to put opportunities out there and I try and recommend people and and share contacts and just be a generous person but by the same token if I bring somebody on a shoe and they f it up it's on me and that's my relationship with exactly yeah so you've so, got you've got to be careful Mm. so uh, what advice is so if there's somebody who kind of really desperately wants to be a stylist and they're just starting out and lockdown's all happening um yeah. and, and we're kind of coming out of it now but obviously you're probably going to be quite a hard place to start from what would you su yeah. suggest they do now would you say like yes contact people like yourself and try to get on shoots like just helping out what would you say to them so I'd say that yeah, now isn't a, a, it isn't the best time, but but also like there's no time like the present. So I feel like if you really want to be a stylist, uh, go on a course, look at different mm. courses, look at which courses fit with you. That's your first thing, okay? Don't just go out and, and think that you can do it. Like all all the great stylists got some experience. They didn't just announce they were a stylist just one day wake up. And it isn't just about being love able the honesty. To dress. It's so true. I'm, I'm sorry, but it is. There's a lot of Insta stylists and it's not like outfit of the day, it's getting dressed, you know? It's like you put you put an outfit on you, well, that's easy. Like we can all dress ourselves. 
one of the kind of hardest things I do is like a boutiques will hire me in and I will do like a back to back one to one styling. I've never met any of these women. I can see 20 women in a day for 20 minutes. Never met any of them. And within five minutes, I've got them in a change room with five different outfits. And that's because I know how to dress different women, different shapes, different age groups, because I've got my ground, because I've done all of that. You know, it, it didn't, it didn't just like, I didn't, that's not innate knowledge. Some of it's innate, but most of it's kind of learned and experienced. So mm. I feel like you, you must, must, must get your training and you must, but if you're wanting to start now and you're wanting to, it's, there's so many different forks of styling, you know, there's personal styling, there's editorial, there's celebrity styling. I also write for magazine as a fashion editor. So reporting on trends, looking at what's coming up. We've just had our first ever London Fashion Week, digi digital London Fashion Week. And that was the most- Yes, I was gonna ask ever. you about that. So how was it? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm one of these people I still get ridiculously excited about Fashion Week, but Fashion Week has become a little bit of a circus, particularly women's. Men's not so much. Men's is still kind of it gets less attention. But it became like, you know, just who could wear the craziest outfit and get their picture taken outside like the BFC. And that's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. And you know, you'd see people on the front row just selfieing themselves rather than actually looking at what was going down the catwalk. You know, and you're like row S and you're like, I'm here to report on that. And they're like so here I am, front row. <laughs> and, you know, okay. it's like, yeah, and that's not the spirit of fashion. It's certainly not the spirit of London Fashion Week. But um, so the digital one, if you're starting out now, is, is a really, is, was really good. It was very inclusive. You can, you can go and look at all the shows. It obviously, it, it lacks the kind of magnetism, if you like, of actually oh, being gosh. there and seeing it IRL. But it's still, it's a really good entry to kind of go and see how catwalks work. I mean, I always, when I go to a show, I always do a live. I always put it up on my, I always put it up on my Instagram That's because great. I know that there are aspiring stylists who've never been to a catwalk show and they want to see it. And I think, well, I'm even if I am row F, I'm lucky to be here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show that. But yeah, my how other did thing, you first get into going to Fashion Week and stuff? Then was it just organically for you? Um, brands would invite you along and and one invites you and then the next year a few more is it that kind of thing for you yeah yeah it is and it, it, it depends very much on the kind of demographic of so so i i mainly get in through being press because i write for a magazine and i've written for magazines almost from the beginning of my career actually because um I, I, that's something that i like and i enjoy um and so the first magazine i wrote for was was more menswear so i got i got really good allocations for menswear um but then one year the funniest thing i got given um an allocation it was a photographer pass Ooh, um, fun. Go, <laughs> like, you, know, you know what the press pit's like right <laughs> crazy it's just full of like quite burly men did you get in there <laughs> and i was like you know well this was my this was when i was like i'm just gonna do everything and so i got in there i borrowed a friend's very cool camera i remember thinking oh god, god if i break this i'm bankrupt and i just went in the press pit and just like click click i just styled it out um because i because i still got to see the show and also i got really good view of niall horan there you go was, which i wouldn't have got if i was row f you're so, like i'm a photographer like <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> But really interestingly, I um, there was a guy next to me. Um, hi, Kino. I don't think he's watching, but he's he's become a really good friend. He was a photographer, and I think he got a sense that I, I, I think it was maybe my first rodeo. And he was like, he was quite protective of me. And we ended up kind of chatting afterwards. And I I, I fessed up and I said, look, I'm not even a photographer. I'm just. You know. He was like, great, kind of knew that, but you know. Uh, I said, I'm a stylist. Here's my card if you ever want me on a shoot. And so we've done it. We've actually done a few shoots. And so oh. yeah. So. You never know, you know, you never, never know. know. Yes. But is there anybody... Go um, on, go on, sorry. Oh, I just wondered if there's anybody that would be a dream, like, is have you got, like, a dream celebrity you'd like to style? In fact, just as I'm asking that, I'm sure of who you're going to say. I'm sure you're going to say Jayla, aren't you? Because you absolutely adore her. I do love her. I do love her. I feel like she's my spirit animal. I just love I think her. She I think I just love the fact that like she's another one like I we talked about being freelance before right but I think that in order to be a freelance you have to have a lot of grit you know you have to put up with a lot of rejection a lot of attitudes that you know maybe aren't that positive and you just have to keep pulling yourself up and kind of and, and, and it's not even about self-esteem it's literally about self-belief it's just grit like pick yourself up and start again and I feel like JLo embodies that 
You know, she's from a really working class background in the Bronx. She was a really good dancer, but she literally fought tooth and nail for everything she got. And we've got to remember, like, she's Latina. She's Latino. And back mm. in the day, there weren't that many Latino women in the public eye. You know, it was all very kind of, you know, white. Um, and she kind of fought for her place at the table. And then she became an actress and then a singer. And then she... She's uh, done know, it all. She's amazing. She's literally done it all. And, you know, like, the press always kind of vilified her because she, she was, like, constantly falling in love with men. And it's like, like, give her a break. Like, she just, you know, she likes men. Get over it, you know? And, and you know, and she had lots of marriages. And it's like, who cares, you know? I, I love her. And I love the fact that she's um, she's 51 this year. When she walked down that catwalk, I mean... Yeah. You can't, I that's know. not Photoshop. That's just like in the book. No, no, that wasn't. No, there's, there's no Photoshop at all. And, and that's, she's what, amazing. That's, what I love. that's what I love about her. But um, I would like, but she's got a really established stylist and also a really ha established hairstylist. So I think it would have to be like a one off with her. But yeah, she's on my wish list. So mm. I'm going to be, I'm going to say my top female is actually Kate Winslet. Um, I grew up with Kate nice. Winslet. She's the same age as me. I love her. She has the most incredible figure. She basically has the figure I would want, and she's tall, mm. which I always aspire to be. And um, I just feel like sometimes she plays it a bit safe. I'd love to edge her up a bit. I see her sometimes on the red carpet, and I'm like, hey, you're hiding your light under a bushel here. You are phenomenally <laughs> beautiful, phenomenally gorgeous, phenomenally sexy. And, you know, and I, I would just, I, even just once, I would like to, um, to dress her for a red carpet and just say, see? Because she's, she's, she's fabulous and she's been a great role model. I mean, she was one of the first people. To, you remember when I think it was GQ that photoshopped her thighs and she was like, uh-uh, you're not doing mm. that. My thighs aren't like that. My thighs are like this. Yes, she was. I do remember that now you say it, yeah. And have you seen her in, there's a film with her and I think it's Liam Hems Hemsworth. And it's in Australia. The dressmakers, the oh. dressmakers, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah like, I just want to, I want to be her in that. Thank you. Like yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the, the, the person who did wardrobe and that was brilliant because they, it was a very 50s kind of style. And that, of course, very much plays to her hourglass shape. But she, yeah, no, I love her. And I, I, um, I never forget Jennifer Aniston saying that she had a picture of Kate Winslet on her fridge because she was one of the good ones in Hollywood. So for a long, long time, she's been considered, you know, a positive role model for women mm -hmm. because she is, I mean, she's, she's not, She's not in any way overweight at all. She's just curvy, but it was back in the day, and you and I will remember it when it was like all size zero, you know, like you almost yeah, had yeah, to like, that way not, not be a size, you know, not have mm. any hips, not have any boobs. Not have any... So like Kate when it was low waisted jeans, and oh my word. Like, so, let's have a moment talking, for that. I, I know. And somebody was talking about those, those low weight, you know, low slung denim that coming back, and I was like, please God, no, please God, no. It was bad enough in the 90s. We will stop it. There's no effing way I'm doing it now. Like, seriously, it's high-waisted. No. High-waisted. We're not doing it. The guy I, I most like to style is very predictable. Um, and it's mainly because, like, I've had a crush on him since 1998, and that's Colin Farrell. He's actually really, really, really got amazing style. But I would just like to... And he's one of the people... I've kind of got all my creatives on red alert across London. If, he, if a shoot ever comes up with him, I'm like, I will get coffee. I will sweep yeah. the floor. I will do whatever you need to do just to be calm. If he's even in the country, I need to know. Yeah, about yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so he's he's a guy I'd most like to start, but I, I, partly because I love his style. But again, I think there's kind of tweaks that I could do. There's always little tweaks, but yeah. Nice. And do you kind of love that? Because I kind of love that how um, I always feel like men just don't really have the opportunity to wear anything other than the sort of suits sometimes. So do you love the people who are wearing more, like men, especially wearing more elaborate creations on the red carpet? Do you kind of love that? Yeah, and actually, um, range is a dream for that, for me for that. Because, you know, like you say, um, I mean, I, 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 I have almost as many male clients as I have female. And I, I, I love styling them equally. And menswear was actually my first love. And that was how I ended up kind of going down the menswear route. But no, I, I love styling men. But I love men who are brave. And, and range allows me that opportunity. To, like, we have a WhatsApp group. We're constantly sending each other pictures of Billy Porter, you know? Yeah, that's but, the one you know, we're, yeah. Yeah, we're like, come on. Let's, <laughs> let's get to this level. Let's push it. Come push on. It. Yeah. So like he uh, he allows me that opportunity but the thing is is that 
I feel like there is a slight gender thing in that men can be, although, you know, it tends to be more suits, men are, are, are given less negative press when they're brave than when women are brave. And some of the celebrities I work with, are, you know, it's always a hybrid of where you see them and where they see themselves and somewhere in the middle and you're trying to push them a bit. But ultimately they've got to feel comfortable literally and metaphorically when they're on the red carpet. So sometimes there are compromises that are made, you know, and sometimes there's a look that goes out and I like it, but I would have liked to have pushed it a bit more, but I have to acknowledge that it's ultimately, it's not me that's wearing it, you know? Okay. Mm -hmm. But I feel mm -hmm. like with men, um, there's less judgment about what they're going to wear. But um, last year I did a, a look with Ranj and I love it. So one of my favorite looks ever, and from my peers, my fellow stylists, they were all messaging me going, holy, Donna, you've smashed this out the park. We love it, Lala. And it got a lot of press, but it was the first time I'd really experienced very, very negative press because it, it wasn't out there, look. Um, and we deliberately gone for it. It was for the, um, I'm trying to remember, I think it's, it was Pride, maybe he got a Pride Award. So we, we could play with it, you know, we could go. Yeah. With it. There were people saying, oh, oh my God, because it was a green suit and it was very fitted, it was very tailored. And people were saying, oh, my God, you look like the Joker. You know, this is just like, who, whoever styled this is a joke. And, I mean, I guess the lesson from that is don't read the comments. But part of me was like, yeah. here's the thing. In order for, for a look to be amazing, not everybody will like that, you know? Often exactly. the best film doesn't win best film because everybody has to like it. So it's almost like a lowest common denominator thing. So in my opinion, the best looks aren't always the ones that everybody likes. They're the ones that, like, 60% love. 20% think are okay and 20% hate. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. My um, old tutor at uni, we, um, we did like um, modern, um, modern, lots of modern books. And so she always used to say that we'll not have like equality until men can just walk down the street in their skirt. Because it's like, it's both ways. It's, it's you know, the men being able to be feminine and, and vice versa. Like there's all of that still attached to yeah like all the million like very difficult things that we're having at the moment it's like yeah you can't quite send a guy down the red carpet in the same way can you it's it's interesting see what yeah to. i mean i just i feel like i mean i love and hate social media in equal measures it's, it's brought me a, it's you know i have to be on it it's a platform i feel like you meet the best of people and the worst of people but i think the, the one of the hardest things about social media is that people say stuff or feel enabled to say stuff on social media that they would never say in real life. life you know they, they print stuff out and they throw it out there and and they would they would literally never i mean i remember michelle obama saying that um, all the people who said all those horrible things about Obama and then they would come and meet him and be like, oh, hi, hi, so nice to meet you. And she's like, yeah, no, you don't get to do Yeah, no, you can't do both. <laughs> you can't do both. And I, but that's the thing. People are feel enabled to say stuff that they wouldn't say in real life. And like back in my day, you'd have to have written a strongly worded letter. Uh, and by the time you'd written it, you'd have got it out of your system. And, but people don't have that now. It's instant. It's that whole instant thing. You put it out there. Once it's gone, there's a dig once it's out there, there's a digital footprint and I think I I stopped reading the comments um about six months ago because it, you know it's just like do these people's opinions really matter to me are these my people are these the people that I would have in my life no so mm -hmm. yeah I, I love that Brene Brown quote all the time that says um if you're not in the arena getting your ass kicked then I don't, uh, whatever it is, like, I don't need to hear what you're saying kind of thing. Because it's like, unless you're in the arena with, like, you know, also getting your ass kicked, then that's the opinion I want to hear, not like the person who's just keyboard warrior and like, saying this is awful or whatever, like, that's not helpful. I know, and I, I mean, I love Brene Brown and, and for, for a variety of reasons, but she's absolutely right, because if, when you put yourself out there and you're being vulnerable, that's what she's saying, for then somebody to attack you when you're being vulnerable, when they're in an absolute place of kind of, you know, no, no vulnerability at all like complete mm. safety you know it, it takes z zero balls to do that absolutely mm. zero balls and Brene Brown herself you know she said that she stopped reading the comments because people going oh my god you know she's so fat she's so this and you think really that's that's like the worst thing you can say about Brene Brown like she's the most incredible po force for good force for positivity um on the planet almost I mean she's up there with Oprah and you're and you're you're really? talking about her weight like get over yourself seriously mm. It's just, mm. it's wrong. That's it's so wrong. true. So um, I think we're probably ready to wrap up, I think almost, but I just want to go to one of the pieces I, I interviewed you quite a few years ago now, I think probably just after the Oscars, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. And 
one of the things I always like that you said, uh, so if we just talk about that a little bit, is <laughs> that you're judged either way um, on what you're wearing or like your kind of appearance, you might as well make it a good one. I think you were yeah. talking about clothes, not like appearance, appearance, but yeah, you said you might as well make that impression a good one. So do you want to just talk a little bit about that, like why you think styling is so important? Yeah, well, I think that um, this is why, it, I, it, I, so I sometimes feel that styling gets a, gets a bit denigrated um, on, on social media because people think, end up thinking it's just frivolous and just like shopping hauls and just having enough money to buy the latest Chloe handbag. It isn't about that. It isn't. Style is... is and your personal style is as intrinsic to you as your sense of humor. It's what you're saying to the rest of the world. You know, we talk, Michelle Obama talks about it, you know, it's like, it's your literal armor to face the day. It's why there's the term power suits. If you look good on the outside, even if you're feeling shit on the inside, just by catching a glimpse of yourself in a shop window as you walk past, not that we're doing a lot of that at the moment, or, or you know, your <laughs> mirror, and go, you know what, actually, actually, I look good. That whole, if you feel good on the inside, you look good on the outside. Yeah, you need to work on yourself 100%. But you can almost kind of trip it. If you look good on the outside, then just by definition, that will make you feel better about yourself and you can work on the inside. Mm. So for me, I think it's, it's, you know, I think it was my life plan to be a kind of, have a therapy background and then come into fashion because I've, I've merged the two. But lots of my clients, you know, it's a really emotional journey. For lots, for lots of people, finding their style or losing their identity, or it's, it's a huge thing. And it's, it's what it says about you. You know, if you opt to wear a certain thing, it's because either, you know, it could be because you're feeling bad about yourself and you want to cover yourself up. It's, it's so much more than an outfit of the day. You know, it's just, it's, mm. it tells everybody what, what you're about. And there are lots of style hacks. So it isn't just, I mean, lots of my good friends are makeup artists unsurprisingly it's not just about the clothes you wear it's your it's your accessories it's your jewelry it's your makeup it's your hair it's everything it's the whole thing and mm. not to be go feminist about it but i am so I, I can't not be but women get it much more you know you only have to look at women in the public eye i mean i'm no fan of theresa may but Therese, i would defend theresa may to the hill for the absolute shit she got about her mm. appearance Boris Johnson looks like he's homeless and yet nobody ever, no. ever, ever yeah. talks about, you know, how, I mean, he literally looks like he's been on an all-nighter and he comes up, nobody ever says, oh, he's really scruffy or, or Trump needs like, you know, let's not go there. But you know what I mean? Like neither of these men are fashion <laughs> not open that box. <laughs> yeah, neither of these men are fashion icons. Obama was 1 million percent. But, you know, like Theresa May, they talked about her kitten heels. It's like, seriously, like women are diminished to, to their, to how they look. Mm. Um, a bit like Brené Brown, like they talked about her weight rather than talking about her powerful work. And so I feel like as women, we almost have like an extra, an extra layer in order to say, this is who I am and this is who I want to be and this is why I feel comfortable. Does, does mm -hmm. that make sense? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you are, we are judged. And, and, and twas ever thus, and I think it always will be. And I think it's really relevant in terms of what's going on at the world in the moment in our kind of our unconscious bias. You know, I've had to really kind of look within and I'm reading lots of books, you know, um, why well, I'm not talking to white people about race anymore. You know, I didn't, I never considered myself to have any of these unconscious biases, but maybe I do, you know, and maybe I've got to own those. And I think that fits into, you know, just we are almost brought up to judge when we, when we see somebody without even without even thinking it's completely unconscious and i think people are less aware of it than they than they than they really would like to admit um so yeah make it a good one and if it's if it's a red lipstick great i had a panic attack before i came on here because i hadn't put my perfume on I'm like damn i'm not even in, i'm not even seeing her she's not even gonna smell me my my... God, i had the same thing about my jewelry i was like Holy hell! And then I was like, we can't even really see anyone. I look like I'm naked anyway. Then you all... actually do look like you're naked, just totally on brand. I mean, like... it could be very on brand, exactly. Like that's that's what I'm expecting, really. Like let's all get naked. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, finally, finally, then, and um, if because you, you've talked a lot about your community and on your good friends and everything, do you want to give a few shout outs to people uh, that we can then go and look up after this, like your makeup artist friends or so, uh, people who help you? It's really hard to see on here. So Astrid Kearney, Carney, sorry, Astrid Carney, who's just come up makeup. Astrid is like one of, a really big champion of mine. And we were lucky.
Yes, yeah, sorry, it just caught um, very slight. So, sorry, it came up, I had low battery. Um, sorry, so um, Astrid Carney, who's just come up, she said make fast. She's great. And then I've got lots and lots of styling friends. Um, so um, Imogen, Love Day Styling, she's great. Um, Future Bloom, Steph, Donna Tweedale Styling, she's amazing. Victoria Genevieve styling um and also um anna barkley she's a great pal so we kind of also also mustn't forget she's a kid stylist but she's been amazing and so generous to me is evadne um and she's also mums that slay and then i should also give a big shout out to um a little light pr who's been very good to me as well and very championing and supported me from the get-go i'm sure there's lots of other people and i'm gonna like go away and they're all gonna like, <laughs> why didn't you mention me also you claire also oh, you. Yeah. You have always been incredibly kind to me and we've known each other a long time, but you've always been incredibly kind to me. And I remember you messaging me at the Oscars and going, damn girl, you just casually <laughs> rock up, go to the Oscars, just like you were meant to be there, you know, and that, that you know, it means a lot to me. And, and loyalty is a big thing in this industry, a big thing. Um, and I think as freelancers, have got to stick together. So, so yeah. Mm. Totally. And back at you as well, like you've done amazing. I'm so yeah, it's like you feel so proud when your friends start doing really great things, don't you? So it's a it's a lovely feeling. Thank so, yeah. you. Ending on a great note. And your battery's gonna go, so it's like it's telling us the universe <laughs> telling says, yeah. days. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining me though. It's been fabulous. I think I found oh. out stuff I didn't even know. I I forgotten we were even having a live. I was just thought we were having a chat. But I know um, we could get into trouble, couldn't we? We'll okay. have to have wine next time. I know. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's we need do a it. real wine, real life wine soon. That's all we need. Real life <laughs> wine. Maybe, maybe September. Crossing thank our fingers. You. Well, thank you, my love, and have a fabulous day. Thank you, darling. See you bye, soon. Bye, bye, bye. 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 Bye.